I'm really excited to talk about this topic, which I've been spending a lot of time on, we'll be spending a lot of time on in the future. And this is just such a great chance to discuss with so many different people with different perspectives, different angles, questions. I think, I, I hope we're all gonna get a lot out of it. Um, I know I will for sure. So um, I'm thinking in format, I could just very briefly explain kind of what I meant by this topic and who I am. Um, I also wanted to note that um, Kristen Ellis here is co-hosting um, and uh, Kristen will, will introduce herself to in a minute. Uh, we're both delighted to be here. Uh, and then we could perhaps give you guys just a little bit of a sense of what this landscape looks like, what we think some of the opportunities are for employing biotech to draw down large amounts of carbon and maybe open it up for ideas you may have, guided discussion, q and A. I I think you can kind of go from there. Um, so just uh, sort of to set things off, put things in context, um, the sort of philosophy I think about here is we've developed really amazing tools in biotech over the past decades that have been employed for medicine and, and food production. Um, we haven't really been using these technologies to develop new methods of carbon removal. It just hasn't really been a thing we all felt was important and, and worth billions of dollars of investment. Obviously, that thinking has changed. Um, so I feel there's a big opportunity to uh, bioengineer new solutions for carbon removal that is relatively unexplored territory. So there may be low hanging fruit here and also, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty amazing things that we might be able to build if we wanted to invest uh, decades and, and large sums of money, just like we do for you know, any other large engineering endeavor. Um, so you know, we have an amazing starting toolbox that um, biology has evolved over billions of years, all kinds of enzymes, metabolic pathways for atmospheric carbon removal. Um, the environment already gives us proof of concept of hundreds of gigatons per year of carbon drawdown uh, running for free on sunlight, which is wonderful. The main kind of issue there is that that carbon is not, most of it is not sequestered because biology doesn't really care. You don't really get an evolutionary advantage for locking up carbon for millions of years after you die if you're a plant or a microbe. So what can we do to um, use that starting toolbox and develop um, the biological or hybrid biological solutions that can actually result in more sequestration? That's kind of the, the kicker there. Um, so who am I? My name is Sarah Sklarsik. Um, I've been a tech entrepreneur for about 10 years, mostly working on mitigation. I co-founded a car sharing company called Get Around. I also worked on lab-grown leather uh, and lab-grown meat at a company called Modern Meadow. Um, I've done a few other things and uh, currently I'm at MIT and what led me here was trying to understand what are some of the um, kind of technology gaps in trying to address climate change. So arguably we have technologies to do some things and the issue is more about implementation and policy, but in other areas, it seems like the technologies aren't sufficient. And that's how I ended up looking at uh, carbon removal and specifically through the lens of um, biotechnology, which I felt was kind of an underdeveloped approach. Uh, so that's me. Um, Kristen, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, very nice to see all some of your faces and some of your living rooms or backgrounds. <laughs> um, so my name is Kristen Ellis. Um, I am currently an entrepreneur in residence with Carbon 180. Um, my background is I, I kind of describe myself as a generalist. I know a little bit about a lot of things. Um, so my educational, formal educational training is in biochemistry and molecular biology. I have worked in cancer research and clinical trials. I've worked in virology, uh, co-founded a company to make phage-based skin serums about six years ago, um, which has changed hands a few times, but recently launched its first product, which I'm really excited about. Even though I'm not involved, I'm just like, cool, it exists. Um, and spent the last five years working for a company called Opentrons uh, as their director of strategy. We made open source uh, hardware and software laboratory robotics um, for molecular biologists, scientists to be able to run their experiments. The big piece about that that compelled me was this idea of sort of a grassroots movement in biology and putting the capability of bioengineering 
uh, into the hands of lay people eventually there's some there's some disagreements about that in the community but eventually basically creating the the tools necessary for people to be able to fundamentally interact with uh, biotechnology and bioengineering in a way that is meaningful for them but currently we just make robots that do lab experiments and that's also pretty cool um, so now I'm I joined uh, carbon 180 I got I first got interested in the potential for biotechnology to really make an impact in carbon removal actually at the Biofabricate Conference in 2018, um, which was founded by uh, one of Sarah's former colleagues at Modern Meadow. And at that conference, there were several companies talking about making materials from microbes uh, and specifically making materials like self-healing concrete and like paving stones for microbes that could capture and sequester carbon in building materials. Um, and some of the some of the companies there were talking about repurposing plastics, and basically that was sort of that planted the seed of the idea of oh, bioengineering could actually be used uh, not just to create you know cool materials, but to actively sequester carbon in those materials. And so I'm still in sort of the ideation phase. I'm still learning about carbon removal. I've only been formally a part of this field for two months. I know almost nothing, um, but I'm really excited to dive in and talk about and brainstorm about and listen to you all talk about your understanding of uh, bioengineering, where you think it can be implied, what you're excited about. So yeah, that's me, sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, so maybe to kind of um, get people's sort of imaginations flowing, give a little bit of uh, kind of common ground for discussions, we could throw out a couple of the um, biotechnolo biotechnology mediated approaches that we know about that people are either actively researching or at least are interesting proposals, even if nobody's developing them yet. Um, how does that sound to everyone? Then we can kind of add on as people like. Cool. So, so one thing um, that actually has gotten quite a bit of attention in what is still sort of a, a small circle of folks who are interested in this topic is the um, Salk Institute's Ideal Plant Project, which is, um, if you Google it, you'll it'll come up at their website and they've got some fun little graphics. I don't know if I screen share capabilities, but it's very easy to find on Google. Um, and so there's a professor uh, at the Salk Institute uh, named Joanne Chori, who is a um, veteran plant biologist who uh, gave a TED talk about this idea of genetically modifying uh, crop plants and cover crops to um, store more carbon underground, uh, specifically in molecular forms that plants already make um, that don't degrade uh, easily. So basically they persist for a long time, um, let's say decades in the soil. Uh, and so plants already make these compounds um, and the one that they're looking at making more of is suberin. Uh, and the idea is to genetically modify the plants to produce bigger roots that are deeper and that produce more of this um, recalcitrant form of carbon uh, that sticks around for a long time in the soil called suberin, just sort of like a cork on a cork tree. It's like this, this sort of uh, waxy barrier layer that plants have sort of on their outer structures. Um, so that's really interesting because one concern that people very, um, uh, you know, justifiably have about doing bioengineering for climate purposes is that you may um, uh, either deliberately or more likely inadvertently harm ecosystems or disrupt ecosystems. And by focusing on crop plants, it's, it's I'm not saying that th there's no risk there, but you're, uh, you're already working with an engineered organism on a kind of artificial landscape. So, um, it's you know likely that your environmental impact might be lower in that regard. Um, so that's interesting. Um, some things that people want to talk about that are are there different um, recalcitrant forms of carbon you might want to focus on? Maybe uh, cellulose, lignin. Um, you could think about modifying the super the superin so that it's like extra resistant to breakdown in a way that the natural form isn't. Um, people have also talked about pairing. Um, the uh, overexpression of suberin with uh, sort of photosynthetic hacks to make the plant also produce more biomass and photosynthesize better. Um, so we can talk about that. Um, 
I've got a couple more, but um, Kristen, are there any that you'd like to kind of throw in the mix? Any ideas? Uh, so many. I, I think one of the things I'm wondering is I'm looking, hang on, I just switched back and now I have to switch back in. So I'm looking at the gallery view and there are many, many people in here. And I guess one of the things that I'm wondering is a, can people unmute themselves and B, uh, um, I don't know, like is, is, are we wondering if we're starting the conversation in the right place? So basically I'm wondering like, do people know what we are talking about when we say bioengineering, like based on Sarah's explanation, does, does, can people give thumbs up reactions? Like you get it, you think it, it makes sense. Just want to make sure. I don't know if there's a way to do that. I'm seeing some thumbs pop up, so that's good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I just don't want to like dive into the things that I want to talk about and be talking over people's heads. Um, that's it's a good it's a good call. Also, just um, one other sort of way of framing this. It's, it's a really broad topic in my mind because you mm -hmm. think about doing all kinds of things that involve biotech, and and um, you could think about engineering an entire organism like a plant or a microbe, mm -hmm. and then using that organism as your carbon capture system, which is, um, I'd say the, the topic I just described, the ideal plant project would fall into that bucket. But you could also think about um, bioengineering, like a hybrid solution that's part biological and part uh, you know, chemical engineering or, or industrial, where you uh, take a protein or an enzyme from biology, and then you use it in an industrial system. So mm -hmm. the whole thing, that's doing the carbon capture is actually an industrial system with a, bio, a bioengineered component enzyme or a membrane or something like that. Um, so we can also give you, give you some examples of those, but there's, there's definitely like a wide range of systems from all biological to hybrid to like out in the environment to wholly contained and there's no risk of, you know, GMO escape or anything like that. Yeah. And, oh, Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. Um, <laughs> uh, so Charlotte Dobbs, who I've had the great pleasure of making her acquaintance over the last few weeks, says yes to enzyme examples, which is very exciting. Um, but one of the one of the only ones that I've actually come across that so so this is such a saga. I'm not going to go too far into it, but I don't know how many of you might have heard of a company called CO2 Solution, uh, but they were based in Quebec and they uh, worked with a company called Codexis to use directed evolution to engineer a form of carbonic anhydrase, which is an enzyme that exists in lots of living systems. We have it in our red blood cells right now, and it can catalyze the formation of carbonates from carbon dioxide. So they engineered a version of this enzyme that could be used in industrial flue gas systems to capture waste carbon dioxide. Um, and they actually got this working, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, because I don't remember the exact number, but I think they got a, a commercial scale facility, 11,000 tons per year of carbon captured, I think they said. Um, and earlier this year, they were cannibalized, their IP was cannibalized, this may be a strong word, but their IP was acquired by an oil company. <laughs> Uh, and I have no idea what's going to happen to it after that, but that is really exciting to me because here's an example of something that exists in nature, very efficient at, at converting uh, CO, catalyzing reactions between CO2 and another form, uh, between CO2 and, and uh, uh, salts to create carbonates, um, and they've successfully demonstrated it working at scale. And a thing that's exciting to me about enzymes is that enzymes are neat little, uh, uh, they're neat little catalysts. So, so biology likes to do things slow, but enzymes in particular can um, decrease the amount of energy needed to drive a reaction forward. And so I'm like, I don't know, I'm super excited about this idea of enzymes, enzymes coupled with other systems, um, enzymes in flue gas capture, enzymes in direct air capture, maybe. Like I'm, I'm very sort of keen on that idea, especially having uncovered this example of it actually working out in the field. I'd be interested to hear, I don't know, Sarah, if you have other examples 
that you want to talk about or if anyone else has any any enzyme or any ideas around this or any questions that they want to ask about it. Yeah, folks, feel free to chime in if you've got a question. Um, we're going to you know, treat this as a role in the same room. Just, just <laughs> Sorry, I was using the little hand raise yeah. function. Oh, that nice. kind of uh, maybe Hi. Yeah, silly. Sorry. Hi, it's Eli. Um, I had a question just about like kind of understanding the end state, like where we're going to store the carbon. Because, you know, in typical CCS applications, when you make a supercritical fluid and you bury it under, under the sea or in a saline aquifer, that's a really efficient fluid to move around. And like, you know, the oil and gas industry moves every day an amount of fluid roughly equivalent to how much CO2 we need to be capturing. That's water, right? But they, they have the ability to move large volumes of fluid. So when I think about like, if you made an enzyme or you made a plant that could, that was optimized for capturing CO2, which as Sarah said, is not what evolution would have naturally created, but that's, that would be really cool. What do you do with all the biomass? Because is the, the idea I don't think is that you burn it to generate energy and capture the CO2 or something. It sounds like the idea would be you'd bury it somewhere. And then my question is, well, like, where do we do that? Like, where do we have the space or the means of burying something deep enough, I guess, that it's anoxic and inaccessible to, you know, uh, being brought back into the biosphere without sort of competing with other land uses, et cetera, all the critiques that are typically leveled at nature-based solutions? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so I, I guess mostly this relates probably to the the first example we gave of um, something like the Salk ideal plant project where you've got a modified form of biomass like growing out in a field somewhere um, so when you when you produce biomass and you want to um, keep that carbon locked away I, I guess there's a couple approaches you can take um, one is to physically remove the biomass from where it normally sits and put it in a place where the normal decomposition processes don't really happen. And as you pointed out, that's like an anoxic environment. So, you know, this happens naturally if like plant mass dies and falls to the bottom of like a swamp where it's anoxic or the bottom of the ocean and the microbes that normally decompose the, the plant matter can't perform that function and so the plant water stays intact. Um, this, is, this is where we got all our carboniferous era well, actually, that was not. That was because organisms can't degrade it. Never mind. But this happens naturally. We get large stores of carbonaceous material that way. So you could artificially do that. Um, it would require moving the plant material, and you'd have to be careful about the stability of the environment you're putting it in. Um, I did think about cutting down a lot of trees that you plant for this purpose and like weighting them down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I don't think it's a great idea for a number of reasons. Um, I did read a paper on wood burial, which was sort of the same idea. So, so that's sort of one approach to slowing decomposition is just like putting stuff in a place where it won't de decompose quickly. Um, but another approach is making the, the carbon chains um, locked up in a molecular form where they, that is not as likely to be decomposed by nature's normal decomposers. So and people in chat are saying biochar, which is a yep. pretty good. So biochar, is, it would be an example, um, like subarin and lignin will eventually be decomposed, but it might take uh, for subarin maybe 50 or 100 years because it's, it's just a very difficult molecular structure for the normal like fungi and microbes in the soil to, to gnaw away at. It's not, it's hard for them to eat. I think it's just a about the type of bonds and the energetics involved. And anyone's welcome to chime in if they know more about that process. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I like about um, engineering recalcitrant forms in the roots of, of carbon in the roots of plants is that it's already locked away in a form of carbon that doesn't decompose very easily and it's already on location. So you're saving yourself transportation cost you know, the difficulty of like figuring out some kind of pipeline harvesting system and also locating it into a different environment where it can be stable. Um, so it hasn't been done yet, but that's, that's sort of the logic behind why it might be appealing as a solution. Mm -hmm. Eli, I don't actually know the answer to this biochar question, but so there's a there's a biochar question in the chat. It says, "Please help me with biochar. <laughs> is it truly inaccessible to all? What I'm going to butcher this word, but detritiv detritivores? 
or organisms, and are we sure about that? Um, I do not personally know the answer to this one, but if anyone else wants to chime in, I would, I would also love to know this. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know that the answer to that. I, I wish I did. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the cons of biochar, or one of the sort of challenges of biochar, is just that you need to input energy to like harvest the biomass, burn it in those um, special like anoxic conditions at the right temperature, and then redistribute the biochar out. So you have to make sure that the whole life cycle is still uh, appealing, which does not address the decomposition question. Um, Let's see something else in the chat here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the way, if any of you have thoughts on this, please just just speak up. Um, yeah. You need to raise your hand. It's a parking space for minerals. Right. Oh, marine biogenic calcification. Oh, I love this topic. Um, I think the there's well not to not to kick people out of the room, but there is another session going on right now with someone who probably knows a lot more about this in particular, um, basically about ocean, oceanic carbon storage. The context in which I can speak about this vaguely is in, so I know that there are some groups that are looking into the engineering of cyanobacteria uh, that can drive calcification not necessarily of shells and skeletons, but basically to drive the formation of the materials that organisms can use to make shells and skeletons. Um, but one of the biggest questions I've always had about that is, uh, you know, if you're going to engineer a cyanobacteria or an organism that can do that, or if you're going to add, and again, I'm not an expert on this, so these are all just questions for me that I'm just going to throw out there. Um, if you're going to think about engineering an organism or adding some kind of, of chemical to the ocean to decrease the acidity, raise the alkalinity of, of the ocean or, or anything of that nature. One of the cautions that I see thrown out from the engineered organism perspective is, is a question of biosecurity. And from just a general ecosystem health perspective, um, you know, there are a lot of questions about the, the impacts of those particular things. But that is something that I have seen and heard talked about as a really promising avenue of research. I know that there are people working on it. I do not know much more than that. Um. Um, yeah, so just another thought of, on this sort of shell formation and to folks who aren't kind of familiar with why this would be helpful or why it would, be ma why it would matter, the idea is um, if you could artificially kind of um, mineralize carbon out of the ocean, you know, dissolved carbon from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, if you could uh, sort of um, further a mineral mineralization process on mass and basically precipitate out solid calcium carbonate, which is basically taking inspiration from how um, marine organisms form shells, um, which are calcium carbonate. Um, now, this, this idea has potential. There's some nuance here, which as I understand it, and anyone is welcome to correct me if I have this wrong, if this could work if you provide your own calcium to the, to the batch of ocean that you're, you're working with, but if you're pulling calcium ions out of the ocean, you're actually net acidifying the ocean and making the problem worse, which I know is very counterintuitive. But if you're pulling carbon out, that's great. But if you're pulling carbon out, but also calcium, you know, plus ions, which are um, counteracting acidity in the ocean, then you're sort of removing some of the um, positive ion buffer that allows the ocean to uh, um, counteract acidity and also kind of um, hold carbon in a chemical sense. So you don't want to be pulling positive ions out of the ocean on mass because it will make the acidification problem worse, I think. Uh, but if you want to you know, bring your own basic rocks to the party, um, that's great. And so one of the ideas for enhanced rock weathering is actually to grind up uh, rocks that can bind carbon and uh, dissolve carbon and actually just throw them in the ocean. Which if we could figure out how to do it, there's some, again, some nuance to like making that work um, and not have it be harmful, that could be promising as well. Yeah. 
Um, so I see some stuff here about, let's see, carbonic anhydrase affixed to skeletons of diatoms. So maybe the fixing of CO2. I like this. I guess that'd be interconverting CO2 to bicarbonate. Hmm. Project that's uh, Eric. Maybe. So. Eric, do you want to tell us a little more about Project Vesta? I, I maybe I don't want to derail, but that sounds interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm happy to chat about it. Hi. Hey, welcome. I just switched from mobile to my computer here, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, essentially with Project Vesta, that's a natural olivine sand beach in the background. We're trying to create, that one's in Hawaii, we're, we're basically trying to create more of those and essentially using the rock on beaches to grind down the wave energy to grind down the rock to release those ions so that more CO2 becomes bound as bicarbonate, which then goes on to be made into calcium bicarbonate. And then when they die, when those in marine calcifying organisms die, turns into limestone on the bottom of the seafloor and it's sequestered for millions, hundreds of millions of years. That's great. Um, so, I mean, one potential area, um, I don't know that anyone's doing this, but where biotech can intersect with enhanced rock weathering would be um, using lithotrophic microbes, which are microbes that have evolved to actually break down rock um, to speed up the weathering process for silicate rocks. I don't know if you know of anyone working on that, but it's an interesting concept. Uh, I don't know anyone specifically working on that, but there are uh, like mycorrhizal, the fungi release uh, acids that accelerate the, the weathering of the rock on land. So there are land weathering applications as well. And at the same time, you can add nutrients to the soil. Although I believe basalt rock is better than olivine potentially, but it's a very similar process. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you consider that biogenic or like because you're using organisms to essentially sequester the carbon if that counted. Uh, in, in this topic area. Yeah, I, I think anything that involves um, kind of repurposing biology to speed up carbon removal, I, I'd include that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, being, we're being pretty permissive in this discussion. It's oh yeah. Forward thinking. Um, and, and so just a bit of like um, context for folks around why lithotrophic microbes might be interesting. Um, is that, you know, there are microbes that have evolved to break down rock. This is part of actually how soil gets created on, on new land, like from volcanic islands that get formed, like, you know, you could look at the Galapagos now and like primary succession is happening when you, anyway, that's a little bit more ecology than we probably need. But so there are microbes that um, are, are already very good. They've evolved to, to break up rocks. Um, obviously, they, they do this a little bit at a time. But um, some of these microbes are actually already used in industrial mining to help extract precious ores, um, uh, precious minerals from ore, like uh, gold and copper. So something like 5 to 15 percent of gold and copper that are mined every year are actually mined by um, breaking up the ore, piling it in these big mountains, um, seeding it with uh, these lithotrophic microbes to help break up the rock. And then basically there's a like a tarp underneath and they pour uh, a sulfuric acid mixture and um, sort of help with the leaching process and sort of cycle it through and uh, wash wash out what they want to recover. Um, so it's not it's not a proof of concept of um, using microbes for carbon removal, but certainly for industrial uh, ore processing. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, there's another biological mechanism of, of lugworms, which are like a type of like in the shallows of the ocean. There are these worms that eat the top layer, like they, when they eat their food, they basically eat these rocks and then poop out sand, essentially. So th the weathering in their stomachs can increase the weathering rate a thousand, per a thousand times potentially magnitude. So we're looking at the biological effects of, pu of putting the rocks and how, how different animals can accelerate uh, the process while also, you know, not hurting them. Then the other one is, I was wondering if you would think about the downstream effects, for example, creating di diatoms need the silica, need silica to reproduce. We, we spin off silica, silica is the basis, the diatom to the base of the food chain. So if you increase the food chain, all those animals store carbon, they keep going up the food chain and then they sink to the seafloor when they die as well. So there's 
you know, just by doing potential ocean, um, you know, fertilization in a way, have you thought about those mechanisms, which? Yeah, I did, I did do some, and this is no, by no means definitive, but some back of the envelope calculations on just ocean seeding. Like just if you could put nutrients and ensure that you're only growing, you know, some fast growing strains of cyanobacteria or some other photosynthetic microorganisms, how hard would it be to get say gigaton per, per year scale? Um, and it's not that you couldn't theoretically do this, right? I mean, there are like giant blooms visible from space that occasionally happen, although we're not 100% sure why they happen when they do. Um, but uh, phosphorus becomes limiting. So this is, this is part of the issue in, well, I, I figured you'd basically need to be approaching the entire world's phosphorus production to get to like a gigaton a year. You're on that order of magnitude. Um, and so phosphorus we, is an element, we have to mine it. Um, so, and mostly it's mined in I think Morocco right now. It, and it's like a key component for fertilizers and growing biomass. Nitrogen is different because the air is mostly nitrogen. So you, you can, you have to input energy, but you can pull nitrogen out either synthetically or um, nature does it you know, through various processes with different kinds of microbes. Um, but so phosphorus becomes troubling if you're gonna grow a ton of biomass and sink all the biomass containing all that phosphorus and that fixed nitrogen, but again, primarily phosphorus becomes the problem to the bottom of the ocean. Um, iron's not an, not an issue. There's tons of iron on the planet. Yeah. There's not a ton of iron in the ocean, so you could dump in iron, but you also need to think about adding the phosphorus. So it's, it's not really an iron problem, it becomes a phosphorus problem. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you can recycle that, phosphorus, then you could think about having a permanent kind of looping farm where you're dumping some kind of carbonate mass to the bottom, but, but releasing the nutrients back. I don't know how to do that, but you yeah. could think about like lysing cells, like some sort of programmed cell death where the nutrients get released, but maybe 30% of the biomass or 20% is locked up in some <clears throat> recalcitrant carbon that uh, is heavy and will sink and won't get eaten by predators. Um, I don't know of anyone with a really good proposal for how to do this. I, I think it's theoretically possible, um, but you, those are some of the key challenges you would face. Yeah, and I think that that last bit is also like an, an interesting, um, I mean, it's, it's a piece of the answer to, to Kyria's question in the chat, which basically asking if engineered organisms can be designed to not reproduce avoiding some of the biosecurity problems. I think the sort of like the kill switch idea is something that gets definitely thrown out a lot uh, when people are talking about releasing engineered microbes or, or in, into more open environments. Um, but I do think that this is something that could be worked on and experimented on in closed systems as well. Um, it's something where if you have it doesn't necessarily solve the ocean problem, but you could, for instance, envision something like this being used in sort of these giant vats of seawater and the material that it's producing, depending on the, the composition of the slurry that it's in, could then be harvested and repurposed into other materials. There are people that have thrown out ideas of having um, microorganisms produce carbonates that could be converted into calcium carbonate or limestone type materials this way. So there, there are interesting ways that you can also play with these ideas without necessarily um, having to run the risk of affecting a native environment. Not necessarily. Put a big asterisk, asterisk on that. Um, I also love this question, is mycelium just the answer to everything? I mean, yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, I really, I really love, I really love the potential. I, you know, I started a, so um, one of my good friends, Eben, started the company Ecovative. They've done some incredible, incredible work with uh, mycelium and repurposing it for, for different applications. And one of the conversations I'm desperate to have for him is like this idea of a, uh, uh, some kind of direct air capture sorbent that's just mycelium. Like, <laughs> just make it mycelium. Make it out of mycelium. I think that probably sounds crazy, but um, I would, yeah, I would love to see more um, more uses for mycelium in this in this space as well. Yeah, that that actually just reminded me of something that uh, um, 
isn't actually mycelia based, but the idea of just could you have like biological parts and just a complete system for air capture built out of biological parts. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I saw a paper recently where some researchers created basically like a, synth a synthetic photosynthesis system mm -hmm. where they took the components of um, like carbon capture and, and other pieces of the metabolism out of plants and made a in vitro system. Yeah. Um, that was I, like a 2016, it was like the first fully synthetic photosynthesis pathway that they were calling it, right? Uh, let's see, there's a, there's a paper that just came out, and, but it's built on a 2016 paper. So I think okay. it might be some of the same team doing some work. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I think it's really interesting. We're, we're sort of, I would say, at the proof of concept theory stage. So we're not at you know, anything ready for like commercial large scale deployment. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't off the top of my head know what the energetics would look like for these systems mm -hmm. uh, and, or how large they would have to be to get sort of a meaningful output in terms of carbon capture. But I think it's, really, it's a really cool, compelling direction to look at. Yeah, and in, in tandem with that, I mean, one of the more interesting things I've, I've seen is it rather than sort of, um, uh, sort of, sort of more indirect ways of enhancing photosynthesis. So one of the, my favorite papers that I read recently, and this is a, you know, an, a, a lab scale concept. I'm not sure how well this would work if deployed, but uh, a team of researchers took a, uh, took a tobacco plant and um, instead of, so there are, there are a lot of people who have been trying to engineer Rubisco to be more efficient, have less uh, competitive binding between oxygen and carbon dioxide um, or, or less yeah, interaction uh, between oxygen and, and, and carbon dioxide. Um, and I think that um, the interesting thing about this paper is they borrowed, I'm going to butcher this, but they borrowed basically what is the carboxysome and the carboxysome is the, is the structure that actually can concentrate carbon dioxide around the Rubisco enzyme to sort of increase the concentration of carbon dioxide so that the, the reaction with carbon dioxide is happening more than the reaction with oxygen. And they basically borrowed a simpler carboxysome construct from a microorganism and turned it into a plasmid and used a gene gun to basically fire that into the leaves of the tobacco plant. And what ended up happening was this new carboxysome unit formed around Rubisco enzymes in the tobacco plant leaves and made them much more effective at turning carbon dioxide into biomass. So there are also sort of indirect means of enhancing photosynthesis and the conversion of CO2 to biomass. I think again, the question becomes, right, like there's this sort of elephant in the room that I think people talk about where it's like, what about storage, right? Like, what do you, what do, you do with that so that it doesn't get decomposed? Or if you're talking about food, it just gets respirated back out. So what are the ways that we can actually store some of the carbon? And a, one of the things I've spent a lot of time thinking about is what is the most direct path from the excess waste that we have in the air that Klaus described to actually being able to store carbon wherever we can store it in geologic formations, in solid products. Um, and I find it interesting, like I think a lot of the, the biotechnology focused work uh, has been more, or the, the bioengineering focused work that I've come across has been more focused on kind of utilization rather than storage. And there, there's definitely some overlap between these two, but uh, for instance, the companies that are converting um, that are converting CO2 into uh, into food or I think Novo Nutrients is here, maybe. But basically, right there's a lot of potential yeah, for also. Oh yay! Hi, <laughs> there you are. I think you're on my second screen. Um, Yay. Okay. David is here. If you didn't see the Indie Bio session, um, or if you haven't looked up Novo Nutrients, Novo Nutrients is really cool. Uh, so they use uh, gas fermentation to convert CO2 into feed for fishes. Um, and so I think they're also like, they're interest there are a lot more 
I guess the thing I'm trying to get to by a, by a, a very circuitous way is I think there are a lot more opportunity, obvious opportunities in utilization in bioengineering rather than in storage right now. But I do think that that's one of the things that I think is super important is for us to be thinking about what does the storage piece look like. Say you can increase the amount of CO2 converted to biomass through photosynthesis in plants, what are you going to do with that biomass? So I don't know. Any bright ideas? <laughs> yeah, and, and on that point, like another uh, sort of differentiation of some of these um, biotech mediated approaches is that you don't necessarily need to produce a, a stream of pure CO2 gas. And so your storage challenge may look different than some of the chemical engineering approaches, sometimes different in a good way, sometimes not, but um, you're, you're not necessarily resulting in the same kind of waste stream or, or carbon form. Um, so we don't have a ton of time left, I think, but I see a lot of really like um, amazing folks who I, I recognize some of your names from your companies or from earlier in this conference. Um, and I'm sure people have ideas of their own questions. And I just wanted to sort of open it up to everyone here. Is there something you'd like to ask us or the other participants or like an idea you have that is totally crazy and you want to throw out because we'd love to hear it. Mm. Real quick, not to like, uh, I've, I just, I kind of realized there was a second screen just now when David was talking. So um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but there's another one of my fellow entrepreneurs in residence in here um, named Aaron. And Aaron was actually working on a company that was using um, uh, methanotrophs. I'm going to butcher this. Aaron, if you, if you can actually hear this, you might want to step in because I feel like I'm going to butcher the the actual concept of the project you were working on, but basically uh, using uh, methanotrophs to convert methane in wastewater treatment facilities into useful downstream products, which is another sort of bioengineering focused or biology focused approach that I thought was really interesting. Uh, yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. Thank you, Kristen. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, we were working with Lawrence Livermore. Uh, National Lab investigating whether that process would be economical. Um, unfortunately, really what we learned at the, the national level is the, the U.S. government has a lot of protection over methane and, and what it can be used for. And primarily, as we have learned right now, um, the investment really is going into using it for fuel. Um, so from like a, um, from, from getting our uh, solution off the ground, uh, we just ran into a lot of bottlenecks. So we're looking and investigating other processes right now. If, if I can interject, you know, I'll point out that there was a recent win for methanotrophs in China. Um, Kaliza announced a joint venture with Blue Star Disio to do methane to uh, essentially fish feed ingredients um, I, at the 20,000 ton a year, soon 100,000 ton a year level of production in China. So it's, um, there, there are parts of the world which are more supportive. Oh, that's useful to know. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I, I, I'm, one, one other thing to know about the Callisto methanotrophs, though, is that they, essentially, the, the, the process, the gas fermentation process there releases about 40% of the carbon that goes in. Um, and because one of the byproducts of, the, of that biosynthesis process is carbon dioxide. So it's, um, you know, I would, this one of the things that one has to, to think about is um, um, you know, it's not always going to be 100% carbon fixation from these biological processes um, when one would want to focus R&D um, on technologies that, uh, that are going to have the, the greatest, the best techno-economics, in, including, you know, both uh, in terms of dollars and in terms of carbon. Okay. It says we're at time. So Jason is telling me we're at time and folks from other sessions are joining in. So Sarah, do you wanna like just, uh, do a closing? Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I really enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful, useful, interesting. Um, feel free to reach out to Kristen or I um, or me after and uh, continue the conversation if you want. Thank you.